Hello and welcome to Scott Rock. Where your hosts from Climb Scotland, Robert McKenzie, and me, Cal McBain, catch up with climbers every two weeks who have different epic tales to tell us. We hope you enjoy the show. And remember, when you're out climbing, be safe and do your buddy checks. No, enough of that, enough of that. I need the actual sound effects, don't I? Uh, Yes, we are back in the air, back on the web. Scott Rock has returned, finally. Apologies for the break. We appreciate you guys sticking with us, waiting patiently while me and Callum were, you know, doing the big sends, sending life, really. Um, And we're unable to get any recordings done. But yes, we are back, and in true Scott Rock style... Let's kick off with a Scottish climbing legend and local hero. Willie Gorman fits the bill of Scottish climbing hero having grown up uh, and developed as a climber in the 50s with some of the greatest names in Scottish mountaineering history. Uh, but he also fits the bill for local climbing hero. Um, as Willie is so modest and under the radar that his name is only really whispered around Glasgow. And from an insane progression into the climbing world, now 70 odd years on, still instructing, Willie loves teaching climbing. Uh, If you've ever wondered where I get my inspiration from, it's years of watching Willie teach and the way he teaches. It has always inspired me greatly. I want to say a big thank you to GCC, Glasgow Climbing Centre, for lending us their blue room while they were cleaning before they opened to the public, just to get a quiet space to do this. Um, So yeah, big thanks to them. Sit back and enjoy the chat with one of my favourite people in the world, Willie Gorman. (laughs) You got your notes in? I've got got one or two things here just to jog my memory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we are sitting down with the legend that is Willie Gorman. You, you're looking at me with a blank face when I say legend. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> no chance. <laughs> <laughs> so we, uh, you know, we advertise this podcast as uh, climbing legends and local heroes, and you, for me anyway, you fit into both categories. You know, you, you are, you were part of the kind of the. the so a great development of Scottish climbing back in the day, uh, back in your heyday, and you definitely fit the criteria for a local hero. Um, everybody that climbs in GCC knows you. Everybody that has climbed in GCC in the last twenty years knows you. Um, I still hear people, you know, saying, "Oh, I did an intro course at GCC," and someone will, oh, "Well, I did a Willie Gorman intro course." <laughs> you know. Um, so yeah, we're sitting down with Willie. Uh, much thank you to GCC for lending us their blue room. Uh, this is the first interview we've done since masks have had to be worn. Uh, so if everything sounds a little bit muffled, you can forgive us. It's the mask. It's not. Uh, it's not cold. It's not the flu. It's definitely not Corona. Uh, but yeah, we'll see how this goes. Uh, so yeah, Willie, like you have got a, a huge. A huge history in climbing and Scottish climbing that, to be honest, I don't know that much about. I know little snippets here and there of stories you've told me over the years and things that I've read. Uh, I tried to do a bit of research before this interview, just like to give give me a, a bit to work from. And actually, there's not that much on the internet about you. You're quite elusive in the internet world. Um, so yeah, like this is as much a, a journey of learning for me as it will be for everybody else that listens to this thing. Um, so your your beginning in climbing, how you started, I think is a is a really awesome story, a really nice place to start. And I know that you really want to kind of paint that picture nicely. So uh, yeah, I mean, t- take us through like how you got into climbing, where where you kind of came from, what your background was. Well. At the moment, I feel a bit embarrassed because <laughs> <laughs> the introduction was a bit over the top. And um, you know what it's when you asked me to do this. Uh, what it forced me to do is to maybe think back to the old days. Yeah. 
which is quite nice for somebody who's been a, around a long, long time. And, uh, and, and it reawakens some of the old memories of it, particularly about how I got into climbing and when I was a teenager uh, and what, this, what the, the whole scene about climbing was like. It was a lot different from now. Yeah. Um, in my own case, you know, I, I think the way I got into climbing is quite rare now. Most young people um, tend to get into climbing because their parents are, are climbers or they've been introduced through climbing centres, maybe birthday parties or yeah. courses. Um, but in, and not that many children from, you know, relatively poor areas actually find their way into climbing these days. Yeah. Uh, but in my day, it was, it was probably a bit different. Quite a lot of people actually, um, you know, went into climbing, some through accident, maybe happen, happening to, to sort of join a club like the Langside Club, which introduced okay. people to climbing. Lots and lots of climbers. Uh, but I could maybe say a wee word or two about my own case. Yeah, of course. So I, I grew up in the north side of Glasgow, uh, and I suppose there wasn't very many well-off people in the area I lived. In fact, you could probably say uh, there was a lot of social problems, but I won't go into that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, growing up as a young child, you know, you you didn't have the, the sort of sheltered sort of childhood that kids have now yeah. you were sort of the door was opened in the morning and you were you were expected to go out and not come back again until <laughs> meal time uh, so out the street don't so, come back till dinner so it wasn't that sort of protected sort of environment I, I've had with my own children yeah. uh, and a lot of times you had adventures and you got up to mischief sometimes and you had to run away from the police and yeah. uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what date was this? When was this? This was, this was like, you know, I was born just at the end of the, the, the war. Right. And uh, growing up in the 50s, in particular, when I was, I was, I was young. And uh, that was, it was important. That's probably when uh, the, the seed was planted about okay. becoming a climber or a, a mountaineer. Yeah. Um, Getting out of the sea. Uh-huh. And, you know, I liked... I like to like lots of boys and like lots of kids nowadays. Uh, you know, you did sort of fairly dangerous things when you were away. <laughs> yeah. um, like probably the in the back courts, they still had air raid shelters from the war, Aye. and you know the, it, it was considered important that you didn't lose face. So there were all these, and if you climbed what the boys climbed walls. You had to climb the walls and jump off, big jumps, and leaping. There were all these terror, terror leaps from one air raid shelter to another, which, <laughs> which you really felt as though you, you had to be part of that. And I, occasionally there would be broken bones, yeah. and people were walking about with stookies, and it was like a, a badge, a oh, medal, sure. a medal of bravery that you yeah. had a stookie. <laughs> so that was the sort of background growing up, yeah. um, and. You know, just to illustrate the sort of lack of, I suppose, parental control, uh, one of my first memories was getting taken down to the canal by a big boy. At, I think he was maybe about eight, and I, and I was only five. But he took me down to the canal, and uh, surprise, surprise, I actually fell in. <laughs> and I remember, the last thing I remember was reaching over the edge of the quay to try and get a fish, dead fish that was floating in the water. Yeah. And the next thing all I could remember was uh, bubbles and swelling water. <laughs> but the story goes anyway that this wee boy ran along the bank for a couple of hundred yards where a man was fishing. Yeah. And he came back again and couldn't find me. And he went up and down the bank. And then what he did see in the bottom of the murky water was my red hair. Oh, and that's how he got. And that's how he found me. So that that's just a wee story about the sort of things that were happening, not just to me, oh. but to other kids as well. People were getting accidents were just part of life. Uh, uh, and, and were you still conscious? No, no. I, I, well, alive? well, the thing is, I, 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 obviously not. But all I remember was getting carried up the up the hill to where my parents my parents had been told about it, 
and I'm rushing down and I was quite surprised at how angry my mum was. <laughs> I thought she would be happy that I was still alive. Anyway, uh, that's how children think about things. Yeah. But thinking back in that, I've never actually been ashamed about being ginger. I always think back to that, that's what saved my life. <laughs> so that's just a wee story about my very young childhood. Being ginger saved your life. There that's you go. Right. There you go. But in, in terms of climbing, you know, probably when I was about maybe seven or eight or nine, Everest was climbed. Oh, and that was in like that, that was in the cinemas and the newspapers and that was a big, big deal. And uh, my pal Al Curry, who became a lifelong climbing partner, still yeah. climbs a lot. Uh, we we actually used to be at a quarry near to where we were. It wasn't a rock quarry, it was boulder clay okay. near to the canal where they, they dug out the, the clay to line the canal yeah, in the yeah. past, opposite to Fir Hill football field. Uh, but we used to go across there and pretend that, you know, we used to sort of say, well, you know, I'll be, I'll be Hillary and you'll be Tenzi. <laughs> and this other boy that came to us, he wasn't very good, he couldn't get up, so we called him John Hunt. <laughs> 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 but that was this sort of um, atmosphere, there was this attraction for mountains. Yeah. And, and you know, mountain, it was quite a romantic thing, but you, you were very, very conscious of the mountains. That was, that was, that the seed was planted there, that it was a romantic thing to be a, and a cool yeah. thing to be a, a mountaineer. Which it was back then, it wasn't like a really romantic thing. It was, it was that, and, and it was publicised a lot, there was a lot of pride that, you know, Britain had got to Everest first. Yeah. But, uh, of course, yeah. The other thing I, I remember as well that really sort of inf influenced me a lot was that in my school there was um, it was right on top of a, a hill yeah. and uh, you could see right over looking north you could look over the rooftops to the campses and beyond yeah. and you could actually and sometimes sometimes in the when we probably when I was about primary six or primary seven we moved upstairs. And all these views were there. Now, in the classrooms, the way they organised them was the, the seats were all in rows. Yeah. And the right-hand row was the best one. And a wee over at the far end, that was all the dummies. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I was always in the best row, he said, yeah. boasting. Uh, <laughs> but the school I was in, you know, it was a, a school where all the time you had to pray. You know, every time you would, you know, in the morning, playtime, you came back in, you had to pray. And the statue that you faced was right on that window ledge. So I was always standing up, looking out that, looking at that view. And sometimes, particularly, you get these fantastic days in the winter. Uh, the campuses would all be all yeah. covered in snow. But away beyond it were these peaks that, to me, it looked like the Himalayas. Yeah. The Arakar Hills and... Ben Loman, so that was always a sort of attraction. And, you know, I always sort of thought it would be brilliant to go up and climb them. You know, that was yeah. that was that was part of that. So every day in school you every free, day, every day. Out the window to mount it. <laughs> yeah. I, I mean, so I, I mean cool. I just and I just came to my mind because I was thinking about how did this actually how yeah. did I get this this desire to go to the mountains? Because from, from where you are there, you can see, you know, past the campuses and you're looking up towards Crea Mab. Uh -huh. Yeah, up to like Crea Her Drain and that. Ah, uh -huh. well, yeah, it was certainly the ones I could see was Ben Lomond, it was right. a big pyramid. But also behind that, I could, the, the Arakar Hills I could definitely see. Yeah. And it was, it was beautiful. It was absolutely beautiful. And I suppose really sort of that romantic sort of desire to get away and get yeah. up to these wild places. I suppose like growing up, you know, in Glasgow, the, having those hills there but not quite been able to reach them yet yeah. there's that kind of mystique and the you thing, know, that romantic side the thing, I, the thing, the thing I've, I've noticed over the years is lots of people who take up climbing it's because they grew up in a location where there's 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 countryside hills nearby yeah. it's no surprise that lots of the people who started climbing way back in the day and even in modern times came from Dumbarton and Clyde Bank in the yeah. north side of Glasgow. 
Yeah. There wasn't all that many climbers from the south side. No, because they can't see the hills. <laughs> That's right. And the same thing happened in the, you know, down south and yeah, round yeah, about course. Manchester. And uh, there was lots of hills nearby and people took to the hills. Yeah. Uh, so there was that, that. I don't think there was many climbers came from London. I'll be back in the day because yeah. that, there wasn't that yeah, proximity to the, the, the hills. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so besides doing all these big jumps and that in the back courts, uh, you know, I think they've got a French name for that. Doing all that now, was it parkour? parkour. <laughs> but that was that yeah. was that was popular. But climbing anything was also quite cool. Yeah. And m the first climb I actually remember doing was actually it wasn't in the hills at all. It was in the back court. Right. This wee woman from upstairs came down to empty the ashes, and uh, she locked herself out. And she was in the back court. We were all there playing, and. She was really upset because she had left food cooking on the stove. And, oh, oh. So without thinking, I, I immediately started cleaning up the own pipe. Yeah. And she was in the top flat in an old tenement. <laughs> so, <laughs> I was a bit stupid. Anyway, when I got near the top, what, I, what happened was the, the own pipe was all rusty and it started coming away from oh, the wall. <laughs> and I just, I just, I was really gripped and I just managed to get onto the grab the window ledge yeah. and stand on the wee pipe that came out below that. Uh, and I was there, and my next problem was, I was really gripped, my next problem was I had to open the window. But it wouldn't open. Oh, Willie. <laughs> Willie, did you get it open then? Now, you know, what I then did was, I, know, I, couldn't, I couldn't reverse this. Oh, so uh, what I did was, I thought, I'll try and open the top one. So somehow I managed to stand on the window ledge and get yeah. up, and I got the top one, I managed to eventually get the top one open. Right. And I went through it head first with my bum in the air and fell right into a big sink full of dirty dishes. <laughs> 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 and all my mates were all screaming at me going through the window like that. But that that was that was exciting. Yeah. That was that yeah. was the first time I really got a buzz from climbing, you know, and yeah. I was I was actually quite chuffed about. I get into trouble, but I was really quite chuffed about it, you yeah. know. Oh, so right, yeah. that was it. That was that was that was terrifying, but it was exciting as well. So, so life life was quite like childhood was quite dangerous. There was there was always people after you, yeah. and you were after you know, and it was <clears throat> it was just life. Oh, it was that was what it was like. You had to grow up fast and yeah. stick up for yourself, and that happened. Uh, but the other thing that really, really influenced me was that in Possel we had this local library, and way back then I don't know if kids still do it, but it was really common. You went to the library all the time, and you used to get books. Yeah. About, and a lot of the books, the childhood books, were about adventure, just William, and it was all about people getting into the countryside and getting up to mischief, and, you know, and, and the comics were, were all full of people like Dennis the Menace, and, yeah, yeah. you know, that, that was just sort of heroes. <laughs> uh, but what I, what I did notice about the, the climbing, the library, was that they had a great selection of climbing books. Yeah. And... These really, really influenced me, and they showed me the way about. They showed me the key about how to become a mountaineer. Was there like kind of instructional books? No, well, the only instructional book was this ancient, ancient book. It must have been from way back in the nineteen twenties, and it was, it was about all these guys in tweed jackets with tricone nails, and and it, but it did show you things like how to tie a bowline and right. how to tie a fisherman's knot for a sling. Yeah, but it. But it also showed you things like, you no know, techniques like what was a chimney or climbing chimney up a, a big crack and yeah. chalk stones. And, so I was learning a wee bit about climbing. It really was. And but maybe, maybe but the other thing I remember as well is that it was okay then if you were climbing up, and it was usually, it probably dated from the early century, yeah. 19th century, but it also showed you as well that combined tactics okay. were in. So you could stand in each other's shoulders yeah. and heads. And you, I mean, it basically was pointing to the fact that you could build human pyramids to yeah, get up there. Totally. <laughs> so, but that was that was my image of, of climbing. It was possible. All you needed was a rope. Yeah. Um, the other books as well that really, really impressed me was with 
There was a book called, I don't know, you probably have heard and read of The White Spider. Of course, yeah. About climbing the Iger. That was so, so exciting. About these, these guys who were heroes and, you know, they did all these fantastic climbs. The other book as well that, it's quite a, it's quite a modern book then, was a book called Nanga Parbat Pilgrimage. Of course, uh, yeah. But Herman Bull. And Everest had been climbed, but what, what Bull did was climbing Nanga Parbat on his own, without oxygen. Now that put that put Everest in the shade. <laughs> that that was a real, real hero there. Yeah. there. Other book as well that was really, really important was Bill Murray's book, uh, Climbing in Scotland, yeah. Mountaineering in Scotland, and that showed you all these fantastic photographs about, you know, Tower Ridge and the Buco, and that was that was. God, you've got all these things in Scotland. Yeah. You can get climbing in Scotland. That but, was like, bringing that romantic side of the mountains. Yeah, I was very romantic. And later on, when we were in our first year of climbing, we did most of the climbs that he described there. Brilliant. So that, that was so exciting. And we felt, you know, we felt as though, yes, we're, we're becoming real climbers. Yeah. But I suppose the thing about that book was it was hard to relate to the climbers themselves because they were, you know, they were well, they were well off toffs. Yeah. And it was all about staying in hotels and sitting around smoking pipes with a the whiskey and all that. <laughs> I couldn't really relate to that. But the other book that really, really was very, very important was a book called Tom Weir. It's by Tom Weir oh, called yeah. Yeah. Uh, Highland Days. Now, most people think about Tom Weir because of his On the Telly Weir's Way, where he's this wee man with a woolly hat, which Billy, De- Billy Connolly described his face as like a Halloween cake. Yeah. But Tom Weir was a young guy and he, he lived in Springburn and he... Again, like myself, a relatively poor area, he found his way into the hills, first of all going to the camps and then beyond, and he wrote about just going away mm. and going up the hills and bothies and the good times and the bad times, and that really, really grabbed me. So it wasn't a matter of thinking, well, climbing's for these hero guys. Anybody can do it. Yeah. And, you know, I was probably then, I was probably around about must have been about 12. Uh, so I was influenced by this. Yeah. And one of the things I had, all the, all the boys round about the place, what we used to do as well is when you, during the summer holidays usually, we, because we were near the countryside, we used, as a gang, we used to, or just one or two individually, we used to go in, into, the, you could, into the countryside. You could probably call it wades. <laughs> <laughs> So you would go and you would try and find orchards and, yeah. you know, you, you finished up getting chased by farmers and landowners and it was, we used to light fires and, and usually you get really, really hungry so we would, we would still get potatoes out of the field and make fires and roast them and yeah. sometimes even eat raw turnips. And <laughs> <laughs> so there was, there was, the countryside around about us was a place for adventures yeah. and exploring and climbing trees and swimming and making rafts in places like or Dewey Loch. Um, so that love of the countryside, and we eventually got as far as the campsies and these forages into the countryside. So that was something that was really, really important. And it got you away from this, I suppose you could call it very crowded, constrained atmosphere of where we were living, overcrowding in the houses. We, had a, we were a very overcrowded house. Um, so that, that these, all these things were coming together. Uh, and at that time... I was really interested in getting away to the hills. And probably the first time I climbed a mountain, it was the first time I climbed a mountain, I persuaded my pal Al to go to Arica. Yeah. Now, my dad worked in the railway. And the great thing about that is he could get free passes for his children. Oh, of course, yeah, cool. So I managed to get these free passes and we went to the Arica station. Now, we knew nothing about camping. This is when I was a 12-year-old. Yeah. And it's quite a funny story. We went, my mum, my mum, in those days, people didn't have a lot of money, so you could get something called a pro- provi check. Yeah, of course. Yeah, and, yeah. and you could go and buy things. But my mum, we, my mum gave us this provi check, and we went down to the town centre, a store called Millet's, and we went in there and we explained to the man that we wanted to go away camping. And we really, it really, it done us over. <laughs> he said, you, you must have a tent that you can walk about and... 
so we got this big tent that was six feet tall, six feet high, and uh, and it had these wooden poles at either side, and they were joined by sort of like aluminium things, and you fitted them together. Yeah. I think we could hardly lift it. And he said, "Oh, and you'll need to you'll need to be able to get light at night." And I said, I know, it's obvious that you would use candles, yeah. but he sold us this big. This big storm lantern, a bit like the cowboy lanterns in the, like in, a, the in the movies. <laughs> so we we arrived we arrived at the station in Arica and we had all these sort of sewn up blankets and all, all that. As a, you know, and and we had a terrible job carrying this tent. We had it. We each had a side of it. And, but we got to Arica and Arica isn't like what it is today. Yeah. There was a big, big just at the head of the lock. There was a big open area there where you could camp. Yeah. And there was lots of these almost semi-permanent camps where people from Glasgow uh, had erected these big ex-army tents with stoves in them. Ooh. And what they did was, well, the main thing they did was gather mussels and boil them up in big drums. And, right. But yeah. they were, they were, they, most of the people we found out were from the Gorbals. So they did that every summer. Yeah. And all the kids were there running around in their bare feet as well and all these wee raggy kids. Uh, but we camped among them and they were really, really friendly. But when we were camped here, we managed to get the tent up. Everything was fine. So there's not a lot to do in Arica if you're just camping. So we sort of thought, there's a hill there, let's go up the hill. And we, we, we just had gym shoes on, sannies. And no... No, no waterproofs to speak of. Uh, and we went, we started going up, and it turned out it was Ben Narnay. Yeah. And we kept going. The weather got worse and worse. But this thing about, we must get to the top, the, the, the Herman Bull thing, <laughs> <laughs> that insensibly going, we're soaked. We thought, they must get to the top. Yeah, regardless. Regardless. And the wind, was get, the wind was howling. And you tell me this guy that sold you the big tent didn't try to sell you some oilies as well. <laughs> Well, we didn't, but I don't know what we, we pro, I don't know what we had. I can't remember, but we didn't have proper yeah. anoraks or anything. And uh, I remember, and Al, who was with me, he was, he was, he was, he was crapping it. <laughs> but it was me that was a pushy one. I said, yeah. we must get to the top. So we soldiered on and soldiered on, and eventually we did get to the top. And the wind was. Remember, it was like a storm. And so, but eventually, and we were soaked to the skin. Eventually, we got away down the hill, yeah. and. When we got to the campsite, the tent was blown down. Oh, no. <laughs> it was lashing the rain. And all night, we were in this tent trying to hold up this bloody <laughs> pole. <laughs> it was a bit of pole. Uh, so that was, that was my first time ever camping. Success. But the thing about that, it was brilliant. Yeah. And the, survived. What, what happened the next day was that these people in these big tents, the people from the Gorbals, they took us in and they arranged to get all our clothes dried and... One of the men went away into the forest and cut a, a branch and made us a new pole for our, for our, our tent. And it, that, the sort of warmth and friendliness of these people who were camping was just amazing. Great. So that was a great experience. We did that when we were 12. But I didn't go away with Alistair for a few years until I, yeah. maybe that put him off. <laughs> <laughs> but what, what, I, what I did do then was this idea of my dad had these free tickets. So having read... Tom Weir's book and found out a wee bit about places like the Cairngorms and Skye and uh, Ben Nevis. I don't know why my parents did it, but my dad actually gave me tickets to go away and mowing. And while I was probably about 13 at the yeah. time. And I went away on all these trips on my own. That's all. Can you it, was, it was so, so exciting. But that it was, now? No, it just, that, that sort of just wouldn't happen now. No. But I went away on my own. I'd found out about Vivian from yeah. the Tom Weir. You didn't need a tent. You could, you know, you could sleep under the stars. Yeah. So that was, that was great. So you didn't have to carry all this stuff with you. <laughs> and I also found out about bothies yeah. and about sleeping under boulders. All that sort of exciting stuff. That was so ex- This was a really exciting time in my life. And um, during the summer holidays, I would, I would take trips. I remember going to... What did I go? Yeah, going to the Cairngorms and walking through the Larry Grew because I'd read about that. Yeah. I didn't go up the mountains there, but walking through the Larry Grew. And, uh, it was mainly big walks and I would occasionally go to the top of a mountain. Uh, another one I did was walking from Dalwini down to 
then older cottage. Right, okay. And the idea was to, I'd got a train up to Dalwhinnie, but I, I then had to get the train back from Fort William. Yeah. And I remember I'd read about Ben Older Cottage, how it was haunted, and how the man who had lived there had hung himself. And it was, there was this, I think it was in Bill Murray's book that he, he described it really well about yeah. Ben Older Cottage. It was haunted. I stayed in that cottage myself at 13. And it was a windy night. And it was, you know, I, I, I was just sleeping on the floor. Uh, and uh, I could hear all these banging noises. <laughs> I was really, really quite frightened. But I kept the fire going all night, and I was afraid to actually go to sleep. Yeah. It was, but that was that was a, a great adventure. And then walking from over the, over there, and into the head of Glen Nevis, staying in Steinegg Bothy, and then eventually going to be down Glen Glen Nevis to yeah. the fort. Uh, Journeys like that. that. The other awesome. one I did do was sort of sometimes. Uh, it's quite surprising for people. I got the train to Glencoe. Okay. And people go, but there's no train there. And I say, ah, yeah, but there used to be. There used to be a train ran up from Tainal up to Ballahoolish. Really? Yeah. And in those days, it was the steam trains. Yeah. And ran up there. And I remember getting to, to Glencoe. Um, and it was, you know, it was sort of almost late afternoon. And I remember, it was terrible weather, and I remember when my big rucksack, my t- I had a tent by yeah. this time, uh, walking up, you know, the big long street you get to, uh, and suddenly the, the the rain stopped and the cloud cleared. And I don't know if you know, you, remember, you know the view, Anna do. Oh, it cleared, just... and it was like up there, it was magnificent. It was absolutely fantastic. And uh, that was just, that was amazing. And, I suppose climbing, you know, without being too sort of romantic, it's a spiritual thing as well. It Particularly is. when you're young. That was just, I was just awestruck. But the other thing that happened then as well was, I, I was too tired to go any further, and as I walked up that big street, I decided to pitch my tent on a, on one of, in one of the fields to the side. I mean, it didn't have any crops or anything. I'd heard somewhere that, you know, it was good. I think it was in, maybe probably one of these wee books in the library about when you're camping, you had to you had to sort of keep the door open at night for fresh air. But I remember camping there, and I was on this slight slope of the ground sheet, uh, the door facing downhill. <laughs> 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 I remember during the night, I woke up. There were stars. The tent had gone. I actually started to slip right in. The <laughs> so that is all part of the adventure. And then, but the one thing I did do there when I was in that, when I was in Glencoe, was going along to the youth hostel. There was a wee book there, Scrambles in Glencoe. I thought I'll try that. That looks good. Scrambling, does you don't need, you know, it should be easy. And I went along the Anakia Ridge, and uh, I went up North Buttress myself. Yeah. That was just. These were scrambling routes, but they were really, it was really brilliant, and I felt, so, this is great. Um, I even went up, there was one point I went up, the, the north face of, this shouldn't have been in the book, the north face of Anakdu to below where Jojo is. Uh, aye, yeah. And then the scramble traversed up rightwards towards the top of, I've been up there since several times, it's a death trap. <laughs> <laughs> But you also, have thought so at the time. But you? at the same time, there, what I also saw there was, there was, on that big wall there, there was two climbers. All right. Two climbers. Kind of on for a yo yo. Yeah. Right. But yeah. what? And they, they were hardly moving. You yeah. know, they were hardly moving. And what I noticed, though, it was a bit strange, was that they were going sideways. It was only later on I sort of realised that that was probably Robin Smith and Haston and all these guys right. yeah, of doing like. Exploring to do the first ascent of the Girdle of Anna Oh, wow. So that's, but that was the first climbers I'd actually seen. I thought, gee, that looks absolutely brilliant. <laughs> you know, so that, that yeah. was something that really inspired me. Um, so the, I was doing these big, big long walks that people sort of think now, yeah, that's, 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 that's a huge trek. Yeah, it was, <laughs> but it was wonderful. Yeah. And occasionally I would meet people and they were, they were, they were because I was a wee boy. They were quite friendly, yeah. and uh, that was a nice. There was a nice excitement and warm feeling about it. Yeah. Uh, but the next place I went to as well was was Sky, oh. and uh, just went myself to Glen Brittle, 
had to get the bus part of, you know, got the train to Kyle or Lacalle's, but then had to get the bus over to Glen Brittle. I was camped in Glen Brittle. I was just on my own. And I went, I went up onto the ridge and eh, onto Corrie Lat. And again, in the youth hostel was this book about scrambles and the coolings. And, eh, you know, I would, I would go up and scramble along the tops and, you know, go around the, the, the horseshoe at Corrie Lagan, yeah. but not going up the inaccessible pinnacle. So I thought, no, that's, that's too, too much. Too, too much. But <laughs> it was, and it was, so, but that was, that was me and my way to becoming a rock climber. You know, so that was, that was, these were great adventures. Yeah. And, and great learning experiences as well. So basically, but I've not, I've not even got into rock, cl- to, to, no. to proper climbing yet. So I was at the scrambling stage and mm. mountains were everything. But just school work. You know, I was good at school, but I wasn't all that. You know, the mountains just take over your life. That's yeah, one of the of negative things about <laughs> <laughs> about this yeah. this game that we, this this balls. game that we play. You know, uh, but I got to the stage where I was I was I was I was time to leave school, and the school to me was it was a place where you get belted every day. <laughs> whether you'd done whether you'd done anything wrong or not, you had to the whole class get belted for this, that or the other. Some of the teachers were really sadistic. But that sort of wasn't for me. But the other thing as well is that when I turned fifteen, it must have been about nineteen fifty nine, uh, I could have gone on to the high school. And that my parents and the teachers were all advising me to go into the high school. But I dug my heels in and I said, No, I'm not going. Uh, you can't make me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was that was a really really important decision because when I was growing up, the advice you got from generally from people round about me is, "Son, you must get a trade." Yeah. You know that was the yeah. pinnacle of of your ambition. You know, and if you got a trade, you were you were really set for life. You were set for life. Uh, so I thought, well, I'm going to get a trade, and uh, and that's what I did. I, I I got a job in the in the Clyde in the the sort of big diesel engine works yeah. in the Harland and Wolf down next to the Clyde. You were next to where boys. next to where Finnis and Crane is. Yeah. So that all the factories are away now, uh, and I got a job in there. And I, I was I was what you call a bogey boy. You know, for the first year, your pre-apprentice year, yeah, you yeah. were a bogey boy. And what you did was along the corridors between all the machine tools, you drove this bogey and it had a handle that went up and down, and it was great fun. But what you did was you picked up jobs from one machine and you took them to the other. Now there was a, this old labourer that was assigned to me, and he, he was he fought in the First World War. He was a frail old man, yeah. so I wasn't supposed to do it, but I did all the lifting, and I think that really built me up. So every day I was going, I was lifting all these big heavy things, and yeah. but it was really really good, and I enjoyed that. The great thing about it was the freedom. Suddenly, you know, you were getting a wage. My first wage was two pounds, two shillings. And that could actually get you a lot. Uh, you could yeah, hand, you money. handed a pound into your parents yeah. and the rest of the money was yourself. So I could save up and buy stuff for climbing or camping. And the other thing as well was that I could start going away the weekends. So every Friday night, what I would do, first of all myself and then with with Al and then later on with some of the other apprentices that I persuaded to join me, is I could take my rucksack in on Friday morning. And I'd, I'd sort of discovered about hitchhiking, getting the train to Bala from there and hitchhiking up to Arica or Glencoe. And that became the norm yeah. for the next six years. That was, I, I hardly missed a weekend the whole time. <laughs> and that was just a lifestyle. Yeah. But... It really, really got me into going away in the hills. And I remember going to Arica with my, my pal Al, and we saw people... You got Al back into it. Got him back into it. This was around about that time. <laughs> and uh, we saw... We, it was probably a bit late autumn, and we saw people climbing on the cobbler. And uh, I just looked brilliant. So we just said, right, we're going to, we're going to become climbers. Yeah. And that was the point... Uh, I decided, we, you know, I didn't have any money, but I decided, right, and, I, and remembering this old book that I'd read as well about climbing techniques, yeah. that's all I knew, uh, was we went away and we acquired quite a lot of washing lines. 
and joined. I was jo- hoping this was going to come up. The theft of the washing right. <laughs> and joined them all together. We not because we, we knew how to tie the knot. I knew how to tie the fisherman's knot. So we had all these ropes, which was that was no, not. No, 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 no. You can't call them ropes. <laughs> they weren't ropes. So that was it. And so <laughs> what we decided, and the first climb we did was we did the. Al wasn't too keen on this. I was the one that was like, Let, let's get to it. We, we did the south peak of the cobbler and came down and went along. And I think we then talked ropes, roped something just at the, the side of... No, we didn't talk rope. We actually climbed it just at the side of the the north peak. Yeah. Uh, and that was really soloing. Uh, and it was a case where I remember that. I, I now remember it was a case where uh, I think it was, it was a big chimney. I don't know what it was. But I remember climbing up that with a rope and it was all slippy and you had to do a traverse at the top. I remember that then that uh, the rope wasn't long enough. <laughs> <laughs> so I finished up climbing with this rope trailing behind me. <laughs> so that, that was my introdu- introduction. And <clears throat> what we had also discovered as well that there was, there was a place called the Wangi. Oh, yeah. Where you, you, could, you could go out there and you could... You could that's where climbers went. So we started going to the Wangi as well. I went there for the first time last week. First time ever last week I went to the Wangi. I don't see what you guys saw in it. No, well, in the, <laughs> well, <laughs> well, you would have to be way back in the Aye, day because yeah. uh, it wasn't the way it is now and it was really, really popular. There was hundreds of climbs. But what we used to do was that if we were there and there was... No, we didn't. Have, all we had was gym shoes or old bendy boots. Yeah. And if there was other climbers there, we were so shy, we used to hide <laughs> <laughs> and watch them from a distance oh. and then try and do what they were doing. So that that was us starting to become a climber. Yeah. But what I do remember then was the next one was that winter, that was a, whatever year it was, it was a really, really hard winter. And we were still going away, camping, even camping in the snow. And we discovered a wee bit about... Uh, living in caves, see, like round about Arica. Yeah. There was lots of bouldering round about there as well, so see if the weather wasn't good. There was all these boulder problems. A bit like a poor man's dumby. You know, you could... Yeah. You could, you could <laughs> and you, sometimes people people would be bouldering yeah. and you would try and do all the problems. So we were getting quite strong as well. Uh, we also found about in Arica, there was, a, there was an old rat-infested barn with a farm, Patterson's barn, where the farmer allowed you to to sleep in the old loft. Okay. And, you know, sleeping up there, it was... It, the rats were running about all over the place. But that was part of the game. Yeah. <laughs> you, just, you just accepted that. That was... That was that's what you did. Uh, but the, the claim I do remember was that we'd always acquired this... I'd acquired this wee green book, the Rock Climbing Guide to Arica. Yeah. I think it was written by, by Nimlin. Right. And, and it had lots of these claims in it, so... But we went up, and the way it worked in the, these old guides was that all the climbs were in a graded list. Okay. Where you started from the, the hardest climb was at the top, and the easiest one was at the bottom. So we went up. This was in the middle of winter. Really, really hard snow. We had, we had bought an ice axe. On ice axe. <laughs> On ice axe. Two of you. Two of us. We bought one, and it was about that. It was really, really long. So I know an ashen brain. Yeah. So we bought this out of the shop. People didn't have short ice axes that I knew of. Is this before, like, the pterodactyl kind of years? Oh, years Long and years before, before that. that. Yeah. And uh, this is what we had in the, the washing line rope. And the climb right at the Still bottom... the washing line rope. The climb, <laughs> this is, the climb right at the bottom of the list was called Great Gully. Yeah. But that was a summer grading. But we thought... We didn't realise it was different in winter. And it was a very icy, the snow was all hard, and, but we'd sort of, we'd learned from the old books about st- st- cutting steps. Yeah. So we eventually got there anyway, and we saw guys in it. Guys were climbing, proper right. climbers, real climbers. So we watched and watched, and they were taking it, they weren't exactly rushing up it. So um, we waited and waited until they had gone away. And, and then we thought, right, let's just do this. So again, we went up, and we climbed up, this wee bit of rope and we got there was this pitch it was really it was a rocky step in the middle uh, and it was quite icy as well uh, and we got there and this was I remember standing there just holding the rope and yeah. brought Al up 
no belays, and uh, we then had to get up this. And what I remember doing then was, it was quite modern. The only way I could see her getting up this was to get the ice axe, the big, this big, big long ice axe, and hook it over the top and climb up the shaft. <laughs> so that's, what I, that's what I did, and I managed to get up this somehow. Um, and then we, we going to the top of it, the, then was, the, uh, you know, finishing the gully up yeah. the big hard snow, cutting steps. I felt, I felt like Herman Bull. I just felt so fantastic. My first winter climb, and we got to the top of the, the climb, and the sun was setting, oh. and all the snow was turning pink. Oh, just wonderful. Something I'll never forget. And we were so, and we got up, and it got dark with all the stars, and we made our way back down, and we were staying in Patterson's barn. Okay. And when we got there, there was these other guys in the barn, and we were quite shy, and we kept ourselves to ourselves. But these guys were discussing the climb they had done. They'd all the ropes and yeah, proper gear, yeah. and they were discussing the climb they had done this day. And they were, they were sort of discussing about whether the climb they had did was severe, and some were saying, I think it was very severe. And, and it turned out it was the same climb that we had done. <laughs> We said nothing, but we were we were really really chuffed, you know. We thought, yes. So you didn't stand up with your single ice axe and your washing no, line and go, no. oh yeah, I just followed you guys up there. No, but there was a wee a wee sort of the ice axe had a wee sort of tail to it as well. Another time when we were up there, just probably a few weeks later, we were up and you know just going hill walking and cutting steps, and we, because we were just kids and you know you just you you're not. A, you don't have the same sort of attitude as adults. Mm. We were throwing the ice axe as we were going to see who could throw it the furthest. <laughs> and we, th- we just, just we threw this ice axe and it hit a rock and the head popped off. <laughs> so I took it back to this wee shop in Great Western Road where we bought it. And I went and I said, this is faulty goods. <laughs> <laughs> and they replaced it. <laughs> So, but that was my that was my first climb, yeah. and then the next spring, we were really really sort of just going up the cobbler and staying under the Narnian boulder and other boulders and or the, the caves or this old barn, and we started at the easiest climb in the cobbler, and we worked up. Now, if that had been Glen Coe, which a lot of the young guys I later found out, they were working their way up. You must start off and do the diffs and then the V diffs yeah. and then the severes and then the VSs. But the graded list in the cobbler was quite short. So it, didn't, <laughs> it didn't take us long. Yeah. So probably by summer we were we were probably climbing VSs. And without gear. Yeah. Just a few slings. While the, the guys in Glencore are still working through the diffs. Yeah, yeah. So but the guy, Al who, who who was my mate, he was a brilliant climber. We climbed in sand shoes, and they were absolutely brilliant. Yeah. In fact, they were so brilliant that see when rock shoes came out, we thought they were crap compared to the sand <laughs> shoes. So, but we, we did a lot of climbs, and, and basically we were soloing a lot of things. But we thought, well, that's, that's what you do, you well, know. Uh, Nuts so, hadn't come in then, you know. Can I ask, so you had this washing line. Did you actually... No, but we had, what, did we did in the, what, we did, what we did in the spring was we bought a rope. Okay. It was one of these nylon ropes had just come out. Yeah. Uh, and we, we bought, it was 100 feet. And that's what we had with this nylon rope that we climbed. We were starting to become proper climbers. So before this, when you were working with the washing line, did you have any protection? No, no, no. no. So you were still soloing? Yeah. You did no. all of this solo. <laughs> yeah. But we thought that's, that's, you know, climbing's a dangerous game and it's, <laughs> it's a buzz. Okay, yeah. You know, that was, that was youth, youth, <laughs> stupid youth. Uh, but we started the climbing proper then, and uh, it was great fun. Yeah. It was great fun. And we went to, we, again, we had discovered that you could hitchhike. We started going to Glencoe. Yeah, I was going to say, when did you start venturing to Glencoe? Then? Glencoe, that was that, uh, that spring. And the first time we went to Glencoe, we'd, we'd heard that there was a, an old barn that was just at, not out in a fair at the Big Bend. Yeah. And it was an old stable that you could, you could stay in. It was open. Uh, and we went up there ourselves. It must have been about, probably about February or so. And uh, there was this one guy in it, Charlie, Charlie Dickinson. And he said to us, 
right, we've got the he was a climber. He said, We've got the buckle and uh, I'll take you up Curb Ridge. And we didn't have any ice axes. And because we'd come up to sort of thought we would be climbing rock. Yeah. Anyway, we went up Curb Ridge. And that was, you know, you're clearing snow, but there's a lot of snow about it, but you could, it wasn't that hard. So we scrambled our way up there and we got to the top. And then when we were coming down, we, 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 this was the first time I'd ever been up the, the buckle, except for the, the North Buttress one, yeah. but the first time I, I really was with other people. And we came down to the quarry, and it was absolutely full of snow. No ice axes. Uh, and looking right down, and the guy that was with us, Charlie, he shouldn't have taken us up there. Uh, he said, you have to be really careful now about getting down this first part. And I remember the two of us looking at this big slope. It went the whole way right down to Lagengarve, right into, you know, the gully at the bottom. Yeah, yeah. And that was all filled with snow, looking down. And me and Al had the same idea. I thought, yeah, that would be a brilliant slide. And what we did, I, I didn't have any, what, what I did have was a cycle cape. So I said, <laughs> I said, right, let's go for it. And I remember sitting at the top, and uh, I was at the front, and I said, right, I'll get on the back. And I pulled it up over my, pulled it up over my boots. And I said to this other guy, Charlie, give us a push, give us a push. And he refused. He said, don't do that, don't do that. So I said to him, right, you take a run and jump on. And we went over the edge. It was quite steep. Oh, my God, Willie. And luckily, the, the snow wasn't too hard. But we went the whole way. We went the whole way right down into the, the gully. It was absolutely amazing. It was a blur. But it only, it seemed to take a minute. And I remember, you know, sort of pulling us, getting set, standing up again. And it was this wee dot away at Charlie, the wee dot away on the top. <laughs> You've got, <like>, yeah. <laughs> so that, that's, that again is, as you know, it was partly the background we came from where risk taking was yeah. a it was something that was a buzz, you know. You weren't twelve year old back then either. You No, but you that time I was now. about 50, 50, fifteen or sixteen. I'm, I'm picturing that that quarry and remembering how big some of the drops are and how big some of the boulders are. But the, the, we were lucky we never hit anything in the way down. But there wasn't a lot it was actually quite full of snow. It looked okay. Yeah. But we never had anything, luckily. <laughs> <laughs> so I've always enjoyed slides, big yeah. slides down the snow ever since then. So it was a long story. Mm. But that's sort of how I sort of get into climbing. Yeah. Um, and climbing on the buckle, we went there and we did we did all the usual ones, you know, your January jigsaw yeah. and the buttresses Super. and a gags groove and but the thing that probably brought us on most was that summer we went to Sky, and we did so much. We got a good weather for a fortnight, yeah. and we just climbed every day. And we were sort of climbing a lot of the big, big long climbs, doing probably like severe's and mild yeses. And we didn't have much gear, but I, I really do remember. I think it was on a route called Kirk Direct. Uh -huh. There was a point where. Alistair led through and he couldn't find a belay. And he said Is this after that chimney section? I can't I can't I can't remember. It was high up. Yeah. And he he said, Well, you don't fall off. <laughs> <laughs> she said, it wouldn't be a good idea to fall off here. And I remember sort of solo in a big section running it out and uh, again it was the sand shoes. And, you know, three slings. I, and that was that was us getting really into it. Uh, so that uh, time you spent on the cobbler, you know, working up through the grades, and then uh -huh. in no time at all, you're climbing VS. Did you then, when you went to Glencoe and you went to Sky, did you start again at the bottom? No, or did you no, no, hang no. VSs straight no, no. Out? Yeah, well, we, yeah. we, we, I mean, basically, you, it's not just a matter. It wasn't really so much about grades. It was about doing really, really good climbs. Doing the classic climbs. Doing the classic climbs, and you know. Uh, and the other thing is that we, 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 when we went to Glencoe, we were young. We didn't go to the pub. We knew there was lots of other people in other, say like, uh, other, other groups of young climbers. Yeah. But they, they, were, they were sort of living in, um, there was, you know, there was accommodation, bothies at Alton Fay and behind the SMC hut, the Etoff Club. Yeah. 
yeah. but we didn't really sort of mix. We didn't go to the pub. Okay. Everybody else went to the pub, but we didn't know that. Well, we were shy. We were underage as well. <laughs> so, but we used to camp. We used to camp opposite Jacksonville. Yeah. Okay. And that was a really, really important step of luck as well. You know, you've camped opposite the Craig Do. Yeah. But we didn't. We didn't know that at the time that these were the top guys in in, in climbing. Uh, but that's another story about how we we got in, in with them as well. Yeah. But like, because you ended up climbing with, you know, you, you ended up joining the Craig Do. Yes. Yes. Uh, and climbing with some of the biggest names. Scottish Mountaineer. Yeah, you know, yeah, I've climbed the like, you, know, you know, I said at the start, and you, and you looked at me with the blank stare uh, when I said that, you, in my eyes, you are one of the climbing legends. Because you were part of that scene. Oh, but I'm then. so proud to be part of that scene. It was a, For me, it was like a golden age. Yeah, that, like you were part of that scene. You, you went out with these guys, you did the same stuff as these guys, you repeated the same routes. Um, their names got publicised maybe a little bit more but you kept quite quiet but you were still part of that what the way it actually worked out was that because uh, we were camping there and we were quite shy really we were start keeping ourselves to ourselves a, a lot uh, we were in awe of other climbers basically um, and we, we didn't have good social skills either <laughs> uh, but what used to happen was that when the creative guys were coming back, people like Johnny Cunningham and Bill Smith and yeah. uh, those guys, they were coming back from the pub. They would they would sort of say hello to us and ask us what we were doing. And we we we, we when we went up to Glencoe, we climbed whatever the weather. Yeah. If it was pouring with rain, we were climbing in big boots. We just went up and did climbs. And a lot of the times we had sort of minor epics. But it was exciting. You know, one in particular I, I remember was it was pouring with rain. We sort of, we, sort of, we did a route called Gangway. Okay. Uh, and it goes up. It's above Central Butters, but it goes up, and then there's this big, big, long t- traverse. Yeah. And the, uh, the the weather ha- has to be dry to do it. There's a warning in the guidebook about it just now. <laughs> but remember. And it's a two pitch climb going across this big traverse, big sloping traverse, raining. We sort of said, that's okay, we'll take our boots off and we'll climb in socks. Yeah. So I rem- remember going across there, and actually the crocs bit, no protection. Oh, it, get, it started to get dark. Yeah. And uh, Al, who I've spoken to recently, he, he sort of still remembers that as being the most scary thing he's, he's ever <laughs> done. Uh, and finishing in the dark. Yeah. And then get back down again. But we would tell them, yeah, we were, we were only going up and doing that. And, but I think they were quite impressed with young guys. Yeah. So uh, they invited us to use the bill. You don't have to camp here, just use Jacksonville. So we started, it was, it was like winning the lottery. We started sort of using Jacksonville along with all these guys. Yeah. And they were, it was brilliant. The pattern was amazing. And these, these guys were our heroes. Yeah. And we found out about it. And basically, what, and a, a year or so later, we were asked to join the Craig Do, me and Al. And, uh, and that's, looking back, that's one of the proudest sort of things in my life that we've been asked to do it. We were, compared with all the other young guys that were climbing in Glencoe, we were jamming. It just worked out that <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that happened, yeah, you know. Yeah. So, but Jacksonville, I, I don't know if you've stayed there. I've uh, not actually, never been in it. No, well, even, even recently, there's been a. It's, there's been a revival. Willis yeah. and you and are in the Craig do now, yeah, and yeah. Um, Guy Robertson and Kev Shields. Kev Shields got back in. So there is a there's a history to the club and a, a sort of respect that it's 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 always been a small club. Yeah. Um, big John McLean in particular. I don't know if you know John. Uh, not McLean. No. He took us under his wing, and mm. and what he did also as well was he took us to the pub. And the King's House was really, really amazing place. Yeah. It was really jumping. Uh, and uh, there was lots of young people there. And it was like the 60s were starting to get, really starting to get rolling. Tremendous thing. So, and normally you, you think about climbers singing songs and it's all these climber songs. It was all the Beatles and the Stones. And, yeah. you know, it was, it was a young, young sort of community in Glencoe. It was wonderful. And then you had to, the thing about Jacksonville as well was always this crossing the river. Yeah. And there was 
Sometimes you could get across the stepping stones, but sometimes it was in spades. So that was always quite exciting as well, getting across the river. But that was that was a, a wonderful for me. That was a, a really wonderful time, and, and meeting all these people, uh, who came from, a lot of them came from the same background as me. Yeah, yeah. It wasn't the, you know, the this sort of like, like in Bill Murray's SMC yeah. generation where people were sort of tended to be professionals and well off. It's yeah. up. This, like, you, you felt really, really comfortable in this environment. Yeah, like the the crew you were you were around, and a, a lot of the Craig Do guys, they were all from like working in the shipyards. Yes, yes. Time. It's all like the shipyard yes. guys. Bill, Bill Smith, who, who great climber, Bill Smith climbed with Johnny Cunningham. Yeah. Did lots of the new routes. He worked. He worked. He worked in the same work as me. Yeah. But I was too shy to actually go and talk to him. You know, <laughs> it was, when I was a, a, a yeah. young apprentice. Uh, so there was that. And, the, the thing that you're talking about, the Craig do, where you know they don't publicise things. Yeah. They don't. They no. don't. They just don't. The only thing you see about them is in the guidebooks. Yeah. You know that that was that was a no no. I mean, I've got a theory that none of them could write anyway. <laughs> 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 so, but they they were they were they, wonderful that's days. It. It, Willie Gordon says the illiterate Craig do. <laughs> so, but. <laughs> I know I've been rambling on a wee bit about that, but it's just something. It just I've just cast in my yeah. mind back and it reawakened some of the the memories of those early days. Yeah, of climbing. It's such an amazing start, and like I can't, I can't even picture someone now or a kid now getting to go through the same experiences. You know, being allowed to you know given money to go up on a train to Ben Nevis when you're twelve and. Going camping in a tent that is way too big for you when you're 12, 13, soloing all these routes with a bit of washing, like that stuff just would not happen now. No, it's not. It's not I mean, it's uh, health and safety is quite important. Yeah, yeah. Um, actually, that kind of leads, leads on nicely. I think Callum, uh, Callum uh, when I was thinking of questions to ask you, uh, I asked Callum what he's always wanted to ask you, and he was he's really interested to know kind of what you. What do you think about kind of youth climbing now compared to back when you started? Like, what's what is similar? What is different? Obviously, there's the a big difference would be you know the way you put it, the parental control, uh, and you know you being able to go out when you're twelve with bits of washing. There you go. <laughs> you, <do all> <laughs> you know um, that it just would, that kind of stuff wouldn't happen. No, now. no. Um, but yeah, kind of what's your what's your take on like? How how they compare? At the moment, I mean, I I I, I climb a lot in climbing centres, yeah. and um, and I've been an instructor, and I, and I think I've I've been instrumental in introducing some really really good young climbers to climbing. Yeah. People like Daniel and Hannah and Caitlin and yeah. young Anna, and I, I, that's something I'm I'm really happy about and watching their development. And how they become really good climbers. Damn, the standard now is amazing. It's, insane, isn't it? it's amazing compared with the way it used to be. Yeah. But what you've got to remember as well is because there wasn't climbing centres uh, then, when you couldn't actually rock climb, you you went to the mountains, and yeah. there was there was this whole calendar of the seasons. Yeah. You know the winter season, and then you get back into the rock climbing, and there was a walking season. Uh, where you would go maybe big long walks to Bothies. Yeah. So I think a lot of youngsters don't really have that dimension. And climbing now, a lot of it is day trips, myself yeah. included. You know, you get in a car with your friends and you go away for a day's climbing. Also as well, uh, it's a lot safer, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but sport climbing has come in as well. And bouldering mats and chalk and... It's still there's, there's still a lot of dangerous things that people do. Yeah, like the climate's still not like for instance, safe. just now Guy Robertson, for instance, is doing these ground up as winter ascents. Yeah, absolutely yeah. amazing. Uh, but the youngsters just now, I just admire them. I'm in awe of how they can climb like that. Although I wouldn't say I'm jealous, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, and sometimes with it, me and the old guy say, yeah. if we had climbing centres when we were that age. <laughs> Oh, you guys would have been absolutely monsters. It would be fantastic. Monsters. But I, I love to see the young people climbing now. I think it's yeah. just great. And what a... <clears throat> it's a funny sort of thing, but 
But what we also did as well was it was, it was quite mercenary. In the, in the shipyards where we were, we used to try and recruit other apprentices, particularly ones who had access to transport. <laughs> <laughs> so, you could, so there was various people, like there was a wee Jimmy whose who's dad was a scrap metal merchant, yeah. and he could get his van. And uh, There was also another guy called Malky the Alky, the original Malky the, original the Alky, Alky. who's... His dad was a, a, he said he was a captain, yeah. and he was always away from home, but he left this big Morris Oxford, it was one of these old-fashioned Morris Oxford, solid. Yeah. He left that, and Malky used to take us up to Glencoe as well, so this avoided the hitchhiking. None of us had cars, the rest of us. It was, it was so dangerous with Malky actually driving yeah. that nobody would sit in the front seat with him. It was called the death seat. I think there's four of us always crammed in the back, just all crammed in. And one of the things we said was that it was always running off the road. Yeah. And in those days, I don't think there was any regulations about tyre tread or anything. His, his, his tyres were baldy. And we used to skid off the road all the time. And, but you, you just thought I got away with it. Yeah. But we also had this thing about if there was a head-on crash, it was eminent, you know, you were going to go off the road. Well, yeah. And or hit another car, what would you do? And we worked out that the two people, the people sitting in the back, so usually always four of us, you would jump out the car. <laughs> this was the top. <laughs> so anyway, the old Glencoe Road, we were going down the old Glencoe Road one day and um, the inevitable happened. It went into a big skid. And it was all these wee windy bends yeah, yeah. down into the... You know where the falls of Falaka yeah. down into there. It wasn't the new road we've got now. So anyway, we did, he went into this big skid, and it was obvious that it was we were going to go over the side. Yeah. And uh, Dave Brown, who was sitting beside me, he tells a story that he was sitting there thinking, "Well, I'm squeezed in here," and suddenly he felt a draft, <laughs> and I had disappeared. <laughs> <laughs> I said, but I had my hand on the handle. I didn't deliberately jump out, but I had my hand on the ha- handle. And just the pressure and the terror in the car. The door flew open and I went flying out. So I remember lying on the road and the car was over the edge oh. and it was only a wee birch tree that was holding it. Oh. It, was, it was like the old movies. And they were all in there. And I was like, don't move, don't move, one at a time. And again, we got pulled out people coming past and we managed to get pulled out so oh. but that was big that was big malky the alky and, yeah. and Willie, how are you still alive man oh. so, like, so they'd, they'd very often they drive oh. to and fro glencoe was exciting as the, the climbing so one one question i, I, I want to ask you and we can potentially kind of wrap it up after this but sure. like, you, you mentioned that you know you got into teaching um, and i think most people who who know your name now, if anyone's listened to this and they, they know who you are, they know you from, you know, being around the climbing scene in Glasgow, climbing in GCC, working in GCC, um, doing instructor sessions, intro courses, the coaching stuff. Um, but one thing that I have always admired of you greatly is, you know, you, you, work, you used to work in here a lot, but even when you weren't working, You'd come in for a personal climb, and ten minutes later you've vanished because you've stolen some lucky climbing pair, and you've taken them to the blue room to do a little Willie Gorman personal coaching session. What is it about coaching and teaching that you know f- drives you so much? You know, wh- where does that passion you know, come it's, from? It comes. It actually comes from the climbing. I mentioned before there that. Um, I went to the, you know, first trip to the Alps, yeah. which was another story in itself, which is, <laughs> uh, which is quite a good story. But the the thing there that was that the first year I went there, the guy I went with, Jimmy in his in his scrap dealer's van, yeah. uh, it was always pretty. It took us three days to get to the Alps. The, the engine stuck, kept heating up, yeah. and it was a heat wave. It was an epic just getting there, and I remember going up the final big slope to Chamonix. And the weather was all cloudy, and, and I remember we had to stop the car because it had sort of broken down again on this big hill. 
and suddenly the clouds it was late yeah. I think it was evening the clouds cleared yeah. and Mont Blanc was pink I looked absolutely fabulous and I went I remember saying to Jimmy wow wow this is wonderful we're here and he, went, he said to me I'm not going up there <laughs> and he didn't he went away back home again <laughs> so I was left in the campsite yeah. with myself and we'd also heard that in France people eat horse meat mm. meat's really expensive so we had got his dad to go to the cash and carry and get all these big cardboard boxes of Irish stew <laughs> stew so I had all these big boxes with me camping uh, in, in my tent yeah. and there was all these hungry English climbers all about it was in the woods at Chamonix it was a proper campsite and so I was stuck there as well so I started selling all this stuff to the <laughs> The other climbers, but I did a climb. I then climbed for that two months. I climbed with lots of English climbers, some of them very, yeah. very good climbers. And one guy in particular, Bill Marsh, don't know if you've heard of him. Yeah. Uh, you wrote a book about ice climbing, but he invited me to go up to Glenmore Lodge. Okay. Just to, just over the winter, rather than going back to the shipyards. Yeah. Said you'll get a wee bit of money and free lodgings. So I went up there and I started instructing. And that, and I then discovered I loved teaching people. Right. That's where it came from. Wow. And for the next four years, what I did was I worked at quite a lot of climbing centres, the lodge included, where I was, I, was, I was instructing all the time. And I just love it. I love it. And it actually led me on to becoming a teacher. Yeah. Because that wouldn't, it wouldn't be like work, you know, in, yeah. the, in the sense of working in a shipyard or a factory. And I, I've always loved this. You know, explaining things to people and, and trying to do it as well as I could. Yeah. That was that was something I always, and particularly with climbing. And that's when I was a teacher, I just constantly took kids away into the hills. Yeah. We called it geography trips, but <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sold it as a geography trip, but actually. Yeah. So that's where my love of teaching came in, and yeah. and I used to bring kids down here when it opened at first. You know, every week I'd bring groups. A lot of these were disadvantaged kids, and. When I eventually retired, maybe about 12 years ago, uh, it seemed natural that I continued sort of working here, and I have loved it. Yeah. The staff here are, it's the best job I've ever had in my life. Uh, I don't think of it as a job, I just think of it as yeah. something that, and, and for instance, doing intro courses or uh, day camps in the summer where you get a chance to, to spend a bit of time with showing kids things, uh, and even working with, like, um, special needs groups. It's, I've just loved that. Yeah. And I can't wait until we start bringing groups in again to do that again because it's something I really yeah. enjoy. So, I mean, if I describe myself as, probably if somebody asked me how I would describe myself, I would, first of all, I would like to say I was a climber. <laughs> but after that, I would sort of say I love teaching. Yeah. And that, that has been something, it's, it's, in, it's in my blood. So if I, if I see somebody who's, you know, wanting to learn, I've, I, I, I take the time and enjoy doing that. Yeah. None of my, all my mates think I'm daft. It's... They, they, but I, I actually enjoy that. And particularly showing people how when you start climbing, it's not just about plugging your way up a wall. Yeah. It's an art, it's, I try to sell it as an art form where it's about movement skills yeah. and saving energy and not using strength. Uh, and I, I find that really satisfying. And it's good then to see, particularly in the case of a lot of the youngsters have started off, to see them, that is the, that is their way of climbing yeah. right from the start. So not getting bad habits. Yeah. So and I've loved working in this place. The staff have been brilliant to me. Right, it's, right from it's amazing. What Derek and Neil and Rob yeah. and, and all the other instructors. But I've made so many friends here as well. Yeah. And one of the great things about when this place opened was it brought a lot of people who had lost touch with each other together. Yeah. My generation. So you, you, you renew a lot of friendships yeah. and there's trips to Spain and Greece and so on, the hot rock, rock trips. Yeah. But nowadays, you know, I enjoy the indoor climbing. But when I go away climbing now, it's either a trip abroad or, or going for day trips, yeah. which I love. It's great fun. But um, I, enjoy, I love just being able to climb at 76. And, 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 and I get so much pleasure out of it. I mean, I was at Rathal yesterday, and it was a joy. I was climbing crap, but it was a joy. <laughs> That's awesome. So, You're an inspiration, man. Absolute so. inspiration.
Well, I'm not gonna lie, I base a lot of my, my passion in what to do off of what I've seen you do. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. No, you're welcome. He jumped out of the back of a moving van. He sat on a waterproof jacket and slid down the corry on the buckle. It just astounds me that Willie Gorman has survived so long. Man, this guy is an absolute legend. I'm so thankful that he wanted to sit down with me and, and do this. And I know that he put a lot of work into trying to remember all these amazing stories. So I am hugely grateful for that. Thank you so much to Willie for for joining us. Um, and being an old school climbing instructor, he will tell you way more than I can. Do your buddy checks. One of the reasons Willie Gorman has survived this long is doing his buddy checks. That is the truth. So, make sure you do them. Enjoy. Catch you guys for the next one.